So if I have a tree, it's going to be hard to do, and maybe I'll put the mic. Somebody hold his mic. No, it's okay. I can just talk really loud. So if I have this long section here, and let's say I want my bud to come right here, okay? I don't have a guarantee for that. I don't have a guarantee. So what I'm left with is I'm left with two options, three options really. I can cut really short just above where I want it and hope and pray that I get that bud. But what can also happen is it dies back and Even that more. whole, I lose that whole stub and that whole transition and I have to grow a whole new branch. I have to do it all over again. No tape or no nothing, I have to start again. But, you know, guts no glory. Sometimes you do that because what happens the other way is if you cut too high, then you may get your bud too high, all right? So that's the safest one. So I usually kind of try to mix the two. I usually try to save two imaginary internodes, or where I think the internodes would be, high, higher than where I want my bud to be. So a good area, if I wanted my bud to be right in the middle of this section, I'd probably cut right here, or maybe just below that, and give myself a little bit of buffer, okay? So what I've done here, I don't know where the buds are gonna come out. I don't, I don't have a guarantee of where the buds are gonna come out, but I have an idea. And anywhere in that realm that I could get the bud will be useful to me, but there's areas where I want it more. So I don't necessarily want it right at the tip of my cut. I might pull a bud that happens over here, okay? To make better taper. I just don't wanna cut so low, I'm splitting the medium here. I don't wanna cut so low that I'm running into risk. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Yes. So the main thing that I want, I want to you're not looking for something out here. You're not, looking for something to come out the sides that you can use. More, more or less. I mean, if it did come straight on, we could still work with it. But I think it'd be cooler if we could introduce some kind of movement. But then keep in mind, if we move, if we make movement into one, we have to make movement into all. Sure. So, but you've got this on all of them now. So all of them. Well, the, the most important thing was getting at least taper. Yeah. So even if we can't get movement into it, if we can bring up taper, that'll help us out a ton. Not to mention, not only to mention, but we're also going to get a lot of side branching that buds out of these, and that's where we're going to build our final design. So if I, let's say I did build the tree right off the top, my final height is only going to be about that, maybe that. Okay. So everything else is going to come out the side, and my apex is only going to transition up enough to where that taper makes sense. So I've probably got about that much room for that taper to kind of finish out, maybe a little taller. So. And then you base that size on the fact of where you want the movement to be, that your end result would be, because that's what always throws me off. I, I start out, but then sometimes the trees go much larger than what I anticipated. Sure, and that sometimes you have to you have to just keep that size in mind and don't let the tree creep. Like one thing that I've noticed we do is, uh, and I'm guilty of it too, is when we're pruning, we just tip things. And if you just tip things, then the, the growth comes just back on the tips. And what it does is it slowly creeps its way out further and further and further. And so every so often, you gotta go in and you gotta cut hard. Like I usually cut back, at least once a year, I'll usually cut back past where I have green on a lot of these or right to my branch unions. So if I'm trying to build ramification, I'll cut back and let's say my branch, my final branch union is way out here, I'll cut back to there. Or let's say I've lost a lot of anterior growth, I might cut back further to encourage that and then grow the tip growth back out. So tip growth is easy to grow. The, the tree's going to grow on the tips on its own. You don't have to do anything for that. This is where the magic happens on the inside of the tree, and that's what needs protecting and what needs care and all that. So um, all I'm doing right now, I'm not shaping a design or anything. I just know that there's a, a few branches that I am going to keep long term, and I want to make sure that I put some kind of movement into them, at least so they're just not so plain and boring. We might even cut up some of that movement back. But it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Bird in the hand. Yes, exactly. I tried to say that saying the other day. I messed it all up. <laughs> What's the saying? Bird in the hand. Yeah. I don't know what I, I said. Something about glass houses. So again, we're just building off. We're, we're not putting anything in concrete because we only need a few of these branches that to be bigger than the rest. The rest are all going to be new branching. We're not worried about that. Okay? So this guy let's set to the side and let's talk about another tree real quick. Um, what's the next species we want to talk about? Remna. Remna. Remna, yes. 
All right. Because I have one and I don't know what they have to do. Okay. So, so we have two premnas here. I've already determined uh, which one I like better and which one I'm going to use. But I want you guys to take a look at these two and tell me what you guys think I, I'm going to use. So again, this isn't about picking a right tree or a wrong tree. This is about picking the tree that's going to save us the most time. Because it already has movement. Mm -hmm. This, this has is a just a nice straight roots, hole. But you, might, you might have a bait. Mm. Delay or taper. I like the square of the bait. It might be this one because of the, the taper. The bridge is smaller and this big base. I don't know. nice to see the roots, but... That's that's a great point too. Yes, this one has. Pull so this one back. What does this one have? So this one has some circling roots. It does have a, a pretty good flare, but it does have a lot of circling roots. So I've already kind of assessed these trees on my own a little bit. They both have flaws. Neither one's perfect. Um, but if I had to choose, I'd probably choose this one. This isn't a bad tree. So let me talk about why I'm choosing this one. Is This tree unfortunately has too much growing from one point. Again, our whole tree is at the top. And to make it make sense, we'd be cutting off a lot uh, of growth. And we're still going to have a very uh, basic design. It's very, very straight. Our first branch is very, very thick, but it doesn't give us a lot of character, and it's way too high up into the trunk to have a first branch. Mm -hmm. This one's way too skinny to be a first branch. Now, granted, it could be growing out, but we're talking about saving time. So we're not talking about growing out low branches to be thicker than one higher in the trunk. If we have a choice, we choose a better one. Okay? So this guy... Yes? It has no could you uh, air layer the Absolutely. Two thirds of the way up, maybe, and develop your roots and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a great great point too. Is when shopping material is this is definitely maybe a better tree if you wanted to get two trees. So you that great point, Mike. Is when shopping for a tree, you might not this tree as as it is might not be a great candidate. But what if we air layer right underneath that big clump and made a short little fat show hen with lots of branching? Mm -hmm. Now we've got a really cool tree and then something else to play with later on. If you did that, would you get rid of some of the fatter ones and just develop the thinner ones that are left? No, I would probably keep the fat ones first, um, as long as they're not creating reverse taper. Uh, but I would cut them probably in half to still create taper to those. You know, like this big guy, I would keep. That big guy, I might keep. The only ones that I would clean out, obviously, is this area in here where we have a lot of big branches coming from one point. Yeah. But I try, usually on a tree, you want to keep the biggest branches. Even if they're ugly, you want to keep some semblance of them. <laughs> well, no, no, hear me out. Because even if they're somewhat ugly, like even just keeping a stub of that branch, because if you cut it off, you're literally cutting off the character of the tree. Like this tree's old. That, the only age on this tree is the fact that it has a first branch somewhere on it that's bigger than my thumb. That's the only interest on it. Other than that, it's a very boring tree. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you'll, you'll see that it's on- It's beyond boring. On, At the you, moment, it's ugly. But you'll see that, you'll see that on like mature Fukien teas and stuff. And the old Florida style used to take these trees and cut off all these big branches. You know, oh, this needs to go, this needs to go, this needs to go. And what we've learned is like being really hard on some of these trees. Like that's the age of the tree. And it might not be perfect and it might not have a perfect taper line all the time, but some of this stuff is passable, and some of this stuff can even be really good, um, and that is the age of the tree. And if used appropriately, you can display it well. The Japanese aesthetic is a fickle, fickle beast, and uh, there's even schools of thought where reverse taper, if tastefully done, is sought after. Okay? So, so Mike? Yes? So that we can get all of the trees decided upon and worked on yes. tonight, we need to move no worries. All right, guys. So we're going to speed this up a little bit. All right. I've made my decision. Now I'm going to make my cuts. Yeah. Can you answer a question while you're working? Sure. Okay. 
It was on the air layering. Would if you were air layering any sort of tree, would you not make other cuts to it at the time? Would you, you know what um, I mean? No, no. So if I'm air layering yeah. a tree, that's my primary focus. Yeah. That's my primary focus if I'm air layering it. Yeah. Because I, I don't want to slow the tree down. Right. I don't want it to focus on anything but making roots. Okay. Does the reverse taper on that tree bother you at all? Uh like in the center area? Well I'm gonna take I'm gonna take care of that in just a second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sure, I make a good design here. Potential trade. <laughs> oh, I'll take that. You said you didn't want the reverse taper. <laughs> I know. I was listening to you. I was fine with it, but then. Never <laughs> wants that guy. Do you want that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You guys crack me up. How do you have time for all your trees? <laughs> yeah, let's do it right now. I have about 40 and that's all I want to see. Oh, I, I, I say that. I honestly limit my trees down every year. I like sell a bunch and get rid of them. And I'm like, all right, that's it. That's all I'm doing. And then I get way more and just endless. Not this one. No, because this one's going to be sealed well, and I don't need buds coming from this. Uh, I've got my top already, so I'm not like cutting a bare trunk like this guy. I just cut a bare trunk, so I don't know where I'm going to get a bud. I know for a fact, like I'm keeping this, and something's going to bud off of that, and I'll probably cut that back later. So once we get into warmer months, so I just all I'm trying to do now. I'm not going to make any big cuts or wire any of this stuff down. I'm just trying to redirect some energy. So I'm making some cuts to hopefully put the, the rest of the energy that this tree has into the branches we're leaving. So then when we do get in the growing season, uh, we'll have a lot to work with where we want it instead of just having to do all this work then. So I don't advise anybody really doing this unless you're willing to do the work uh, of protection. So I really now am presenting, uh, this is gonna be a pain for me to bring these in all the time, but because I love so you guys annoying. so much and you're my favorite club, so you'll put it out in the day and then when it gets cold at night you'll bring it that's in. a that's a great question okay so so it, it was asked if I if I bring it in during the day or bring it in during the night and put it out during the day uh, sometimes if it's really cold and I know it's gonna be cold this the very next night I don't do the work twice I bring it in and I wait until the, it might even be three or four days and I wait until the temperatures stabilize and then I put the trees out. All right, it's not ideal because trees want light and all that, but they want to be stable in temperature more than they want sun. Okay. Okay? okay. They want that and more. And then if it's in, as far as watering, so you would still? I, I would, so a, a great tip, guys, mm -hmm. just to get them in the back too. A great tip, guys, is if you're gonna bring your trees in for the winter, is to make sure that you water them. If you know they're gonna be in for three days, water them good the first day and set them inside and you won't have to water them for three days because we're taking away a lot of elements. So what's a big humidity. element that affects transpiration? Humidity. Sun. Sun, sun. sun and, and humidity. So if you don't have the sun, you've just cut a lot of transpiration. So okay. you've saved yourself a lot of water use. Because okay? I've been full so and bringing in and out. In and the front's out. probably going to be here, but we don't know for sure because we might get new options that change everything. We might get something that pops out where we're like, oh great, we can turn the whole thing. So just for the sake of time, let's just keep moving. I want to okay. get to the, uh, the Molina I'm honestly not going to do anything with because as we can all see, the Molina don't look, uh, do they look ready to work? No. no. Okay. <laughs> and what did we just spend an hour talking about? Health, health. Health, health, health. When to know when to work a tree, right? So neither of these trees look particularly vigorous, do they? No. 
So are they going to recover from the work we do? Probably not. not. Probably not. So these trees I'm probably going to let sit, but I'll tell you which tree I'm going to pick. Okay. Who knows? The one near me. The one that's healthy? No. no. We don't. This one here. This one. Yeah, this one. This one, because it has some yeah, it has this more one. options. Yeah. So this has a lot more options. This gives us a better trunk, better branching, and so long term will be a better tree. And I know because I peaked, it has better roots. I would fertilize it now. So when I get home, the first thing I'm going to do to all these trees, because I picked these up from Eric today, and I know Eric has a pretty good fertilizer regimen. I know he fertilizes things on time, but I personally don't know when he last fertilized them. Okay? So I need to, A, what I'm going to do to these is scrape off the top third layer of soil. I'm going to apply fresh fertilizer, put fresh soil on top. I'm going to stick them out in the full sun, and I'm going to baby the heck out of them. Baby them. I'm going to check them every day. In the evening, I'm going to come home, I'm going to look at them. Did I give them too much water? Did I give them too little? And then I'm going to make the, the adjustment. Okay? Okay. So, Mike, you could, uh, oh. you could bring the one <laughs> that's going to work two months from now. It should be in good health. Sure. And do the... That's the uh, and that's, that's what I was planning. So, uh, my original plan was to do a lot of this work on the next visit. But some of these trees, the Nerifolia, uh, is probably going to be slow, slower to come. Uh, the Premna, I'm not too worried about it. I really want to make sure we get some new branches in the right direction. And the sea hibiscus, I'm not super concerned about. So let's just take a look at these two sea hibiscus. Now this is probably the toughest choice of the night. Okay. Both trees have flaws. Both trees have some really good uh, potential in them. I don't even know which one I'm going to pick yet. So maybe you could move them. They do both have a they do both have a circling root. Can you move them at all? You, the uh, circling roots that, when they're at a certain size you can. Okay. But here's an even better option: grow new roots because okay. these are so prolific and so easy to work on. So this is the tree that if you're a beginner to bonsai, this is the tree you need to own. Okay, the okay. mayho. It's a tree that I promise you you can beat the heck out of it. You can overwater it. You can wire it and crack the branches and it will still live. Um, on some of these that I've grown, you can see that I've broken the trunk several times and not cut pasted it, and it just grows just fine. Wow. I've grafted to these things. Uh, they take just about any graft you throw at them. Uh, they grow extremely fast. So this, this cutting I rooted four months ago. Oh. So four months old. Wow. So this is gonna be a finished bonsai in probably three years. I will have this through development in probably a year if I keep at it. Okay, so this is something that as a beginner, we all need to start with one of these because it's probably the most abuse tolerant tree you can own. All right, more so than a ficus. Everyone says ficus, ficus, ficus. This blows a ficus out of the water. <laughs> blows it out of the water. So uh, the leaf starts very, very large, but anybody who's seen the ones that come out of Taiwan know that these leaves get about the size of my pinky nail with proper ramification. And the ramification on these is second to none in the world. So one of the best trees you can use for bonsai. So out of these two trees, it's a tough pick because both of these can be great trees and they both have, uh, they both have flaws that need to be fixed, but I think I'm gonna go with this one, okay? I think I'm gonna go with it. I just think that it has less to correct. This one has a huge circling root, which is gonna be a big cutback. Uh, to deal with, and that's going to slow the tree's development down. It's not going to what hurt it. Mean circling root? So a circling root is a root that circles around the tree and crosses the nabari. Oh. So on a perfect tree, we have roots that extend out like yeah. a clock. Mm -hmm. So they come out evenly all the way around. And so something like that is hard to, to fix, you know, something that thick without doing like a ground layer and growing all new roots. Okay. So that's probably one of the biggest reasons. How long would it take to grow all new roots? Honestly, on these guys, probably to fix your nabari on a tree this size, two years. So it's not something you want to do if you don't have to do it. You know, if you find a better tree, that's the better deal. But uh, a lot of times we get trees that have such a good top and they have inferior roots and you're like, man, the tree's killer up top though. So you put in the two years, you know. And it's stuff that you'll still have a nice tree, you just will refine it. Okay. So, so this is the tree that we're gonna use. 
Um, the only thing I'm really going to do to this tree is just cut off some of the basil shoots. Now, I could be very aggressive with this tree because this is one of those trees, as I mentioned earlier, that as soon as we warm up, this tree starts growing. As soon as we get cold, it stops growing. But just like we've seen in Florida, there's a lot of times through the winter where we have 85 degree days. And so that's a time that can be used growing this tree. Okay. Um, this tree is also has some of the best wound healing capabilities I've seen. So big wounds like this on this tree don't bother me at all. Okay, not at all. Because I can heal that big wound and honestly, if I really put my mind to it, I could heal that giant wound in about a year. Okay. Oh, if you put your mind to it, what does yeah. that okay. mean? Okay, <laughs> no, that's, that's a great question. Yeah. What does that mean, put my mind to it? It means if I can hold off pruning long enough to heal it. So this is what happens, and it happens to the best of us, is I sit and I stare at that sea hibiscus day after day after day, and, you are so bad and I say, is today the day? <laughs> are the branches thick enough? And I say to myself, you know what? They're probably thick enough, and I could probably grow the rest with secondary branches. They're probably thick. I'm just going to go cut it. And then I say, no. No, don't cut it. Give it a little bit longer, because I know if I can make it to another year, and I can get it to the point where all those wounds are healed, then when I finally do cut it, it's going to be the tree I've always wanted it to be. And it's not going to be a step below that. It's not going to be a compromise. It's like an alcoholic not taking a drink. Right. Of yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it is tough. But that is, that, that's the beauty of it, is the longer you can stay your hand, the longer you can stay your hand, the better you've done. A great example of that is this tree. I, I have really skinny first branches. And I tried so hard. This year, was my goal was to run those branches, put this back in development. And I ran them, and I ran them, and I couldn't get the thickness I wanted, and then I had company coming over, and I'm like, you know what, I can't have the tree looking like this. <laughs> and so I pruned it in real hard, and I set myself back for development work for that instant gratification. You know? And so now I have to start the whole process over of guiding the vigor to those lower branches, running them out, and then waiting. Whereas if I would have just checked my hand, I wouldn't have lost the progress. Or not had company. Or not yeah. have company. Have yeah. Don't have friends. Can't have friends in bonsai. Hidden the tree from the company. Yeah. No hey, that's true. That's true. But I wanted them to see the trees too. You know. So. <laughs> Were they not bonsai people? No, of oh, course not. I gotta make it. Yeah, I gotta make it look good for them so they know. Yeah. So, um, so what's your plan with this? Then? So my plan for this is to a run the branches first. So yeah. the first thing I do with a tree like this, first of all, I gotta put cut paste on that wound. But it's run the branches. So the name of the game is. Get big, thick, primary branches first, okay? We're not trying to get a million branches yet. We're not trying to get our ramification. We don't need any of that. <clears throat> ramification, leaf size, none of that matters. We're growing bones, okay? If you were building anything else, if you see a house being built, they erect a structure first, right? And then everything else is built on that structure. It's the same exact thing. We need to build a quality structure first, good bones, and then refine on top of that, add our branches on top of that. Okay, and we need to have that as a plan. So my plan, to add, answer your question, is to take my first few branches, my first two, mm -hmm. and run them faster than the rest. Get them to pick up vigor. Mm. So, so, so you have an apex there then? Yeah. I have oh, an yeah. apex right in, my apex is in here somewhere. Mm -hmm. oh, we're gonna be up so your idea would be, okay. let the first, br this second is branches. So, so far this is the front, but it may change because we're so early in this, mm -hmm. this uh, designing game yeah, that this front may change. But I think that's going to be where we settle in, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably going to take off a few more of these front branches. Got my little... So when you said that you would take your first two branches and you would let them run over the other ones, so are you then cutting back the other ones while they... Well, not, not just cutting back. So there's something, and, and I didn't want to get into this too much until we got into uh, refinement. But there's a, a good tool of uh, adjusting vigor, okay? So if I need vigor to go from one spot of the tree to another spot, and I don't want to cut the branch, okay? I don't want to prune the top. I just take a leaf off. Take, leaf. Take, take two okay. leaves off. You know, all I got to do is weaken this more than this considerably, and it'll start to grow. Mm -hmm. um, one technique that you'll see as we get into refinement that we'll do that's really good for keeping your tree healthy is every four months or so you go through the tree and you assess the health of each branch. This sounds like mind-numbing work, and it is, but it's the kind of stuff that separates the really great trees from the not great trees. 
So you go through your, your trees and you say, all right, this branch has four leaves, this branch has two leaves, this branch has four leaves. And so if I have a branch that's very, very strong, this is a better example. If I have a branch that's very, very strong and has 18 leaves on it, and I have one branch that's almost dead and it has one leaf on it, I cut that one with 18 to one leaf. And I don't touch the one with one leaf. Okay? Push that energy. Push the energy. And so, and I keep doing that. I keep weakening the other side of the tree until the weak side of the tree starts to pick up the energy. Mm -hmm. And that's called balance. That is the art of bonsai. So bonsai is the practice, it's like horticultural excellence. When you see a Japanese version of a pine, it's not just pretty, it's horticulturally perfect. Like every tuft on the pine, be it on the bottom of the tree or the top of the tree, is the same density and size. That means the vigor has been balanced 100% through the tree. That's the art of bonsai, okay? Horticulture, horticulture. Okay. Like this one also has a circling that can But that's be, a that's a lot smaller and of a circling you can root. Get rid of it and later. I can get rid of that a lot easier. I could even get rid of it now, but to keep the tree strong healthy, yeah. and healthy, I'm not gonna do it. Because even that will slow it down. Although you can be super aggressive on these guys, if you work them hard, you'll slow them down and you can do things faster. So like things like root corrections will slow it down. If you cut a, the biggest, strongest root on it, it's gonna slow it down. So if you're trying to get a big trunk, you don't want to be cutting roots. Mm -hmm. you know? So again, just to kind of uh, go over what we talked about tonight, is our first step is health. We assess the health of a tree first and assess when it can be worked on and what we need to do to get it ready to be worked on. And we don't touch it till it's to that point. So mm -hmm. tropicals, that may be months, that may be weeks. Junipers, conifers, that could be years. And some of the material might be worth it. If you collected a, a tree that's worth $12,000, and you didn't want to kill it, you'd spend the three years recovering it until you got it to the point where you felt safe. So the next thing is going to be development, building our bones, healing our wounds, creating our trunk line. That's all that's about. All right? It has nothing to do with, um, with small leaves, uh, a lot of branches, or anything like that. It has to do with quick growth, quick explosive growth. And to talk about that, just to add on to one little thing about that, is in development, even our soil is a little different than in refinement. So when we are in uh, development, we want that very, very coarse mix that allows us to grow explosively long branches, right? But then as we start to get more and more branching, we need to feed those branches, we can keep those branches moist. And as we get more and more ramification, that becomes more and more difficult with a coarse mix. So in Japan, that's when they start amending in a lot of akadama, river sand. So we're amending it in, not all at once. Some trees, they just amend in a little bit. As it builds branches, you amend more and more in. And that's when you start building your mix to be less about explosive growth and more about holding consistent moisture so that all those branches don't dry out throughout the day. Okay. okay? That, that's the kind of stuff, these techniques, switching between de development to refinement is how you pass that plateau. Okay? We've all gotten to the, the edge of development, I think, most of us in here who we have done this a little while, we've gotten our trees to the point where they're past development. And so now it's time to kind of assess those trees and say, let's take them a little further. Like, why hasn't it gone further? When you also get into de, uh, refinement, do you find that the particle becomes smaller because you have more of a delicate root it, system? It doesn't necessarily have to. So with things like, uh, sometimes it's a good idea, but with things like Akadama, Akadama, even if you use a large per particle, it breaks down. Right. So Akadama, and some trees love that. Some trees really love that broken down clay root ball. That's why Akadama is such a sought after component is that it is really, really good for root health in the right environment with the right technique. So it really is. I mean, it is one of the best there is because of the way it breaks down. Things like Bougainvillea probably aren't gonna like it, you know? So, so are, are you going to do anything with the soil over the course of the next couple of months, or are we going to leave it in this camp? No, I'm going to probably, the first time, so our next meeting is in March. 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 So March is probably the beginning of when I can, I could probably realistically start to mess with the soil on this. <coughs> Still, like, if you wanted to be 100% safe, you'd hold off till maybe April. But we're definitely getting into where we can work on this. Um, the ficus, for sure, right there. Uh, I would hold off on the premna still, yeah. let that grow out a little bit more, and uh, and 
the melina should be re recovering pretty well by then, so we should be able to do some work to that. But uh, this guy is going to be one of the first ones that we can mess with the roots. This and this. And that will be the first thing I do, is get it repotted into proper soil so it's not an issue. So we've taken pictures of everything before and now to this point. And we'll probably put those online so that you all can see them. Frank will put them online. And then when we see them in March, we're going to see a big difference. And understand that when we see them in December, when they're going to be uh, auctioned or no, raffled off, they're not going to be complete. No. But that's the point. That's the point. So we're going to start selling raffle tickets in March. <laughs> yeah, and so it's kind of like betting the horses, right? No, it, it is. Uh, it, it is true. So bonsai is not not the game. I mean, it is the game of patience. And the more patience you have, the better trees you'll get. Uh, but that's not to say that we won't be significantly further than where we're at in a year. Like we should all be able to see. Uh, the direction we're taking by the end of this year. We should all have a path, we should have the tree on that path, and we should at least be able to see where the finish line's at. Okay, That's the goal of this. So realistically remember that these development and these refinement tasks, are there's not a, a rule to them like development takes three years. It's about you, and it's about how long can you stay your hand. Okay, When are you content with it? Honestly, a good rule of thumb for a lot of contemporary bonsai is your first branch looks best, not saying it has to be this way, looks best if it's a third the size of your trunk. A third. That's huge. Yeah. That means for this trunk, for this to look appropriate, we need a branch that's probably a little bigger than my thumb. And that sounds about right for a big tree in nature. Sure. You know, if you want to have a nice big branch. So that's kind of why we're doing all this work, to run those branches out, to tell that story. Because once you put it in a bonsai pot, that's the opposite of what we're doing. The bonsai pot is like this. You don't frame, a, I've said this before, so those of you who've heard it, I'm sorry. You don't frame a painting before you've painted it. All right? Mm -hmm. So you don't go and you don't find a, a bonsai pot and then just stick your tree in it and hope that it develops because it won't. That bonsai pot is meant for the final product to slow it down so you hold it in that, that zone for as long as possible. And I'm not saying you can't do that because my little Premna's lived its entire development life in a bonsai pot. This has never been developed in a bigger pot. And it's, it's a great tree. It is. I like this tree. It could have been better. Okay? I could have gotten further. And, and why is it some of us like I, pretty little pots? That's fine. I like, I, I like pretty pots too. But you just got to wait until the tree's ready for the pretty little pot. That's, right. That's all. You still have that person so, I want. I know. So to answer your question, the double potting, without getting too far into that, this is a technique for uh, keeping refined trees healthy on show and level. So it basically, I'll show you guys, this is why I did this, is it allows the roots to run through the bottom, like that, out the bottom of the pot, into the secondary pot, and so it tricks the tree. It thinks it's in a bigger pot than it is, and it uh -huh. gives it a little more root growth. It allows it to grow and be happy, and then when I want to, I can cut those roots off, and it really won't stress the tree that much. You might get a few yellow leaves here and there, but if you time it appropriately, you won't even notice it. So, does that work for all, like, all show hidden trees? Is it just for tropicals or? No, it works for all of them. And this is so. There's a few things that I, that just to kind of illustrate the kind of care that goes into this kind of stuff is I'll even put collars on these, like little branch collars that hold soil up higher, because when you think about show in plants, not to get too far down this rabbit hole, but or any bonsai pot, is what do you think happens to this bonsai pot about? Halfway through the day, and, and the top dries out. Right, the top dries out. So if the top dries out, and we're trying to build ramification, are we really growing in a two-inch deep pot, or are we growing in a one-inch deep pot? Right. Because those top roots are dying every day. So sometimes when we have these really delicate pots and whatnot, we'll put those soil collars on to protect the roots under the soil, give them a little buffer so that we can actually use the full depth of our pot and continue to build ramification. That's probably helps in the summertime. It does. It helps a lot in the summertime. It helps more so, what I've noticed, the worst time for watering is about May and June. Okay, May and June is like death to plants. I've had to water my plants in May and June, uh, like I said, twice a day, submerging them in buckets. And uh, the name of the game at that time. Why 
Because we, we get no rain and we're super, we have the heat of summer with no rain, no cloud cover. And it's usually very windy as well. So those three things, that's the hardest time. So that's usually when I'll even pull a lot of shades into, or a lot of trees into the shade. You know, keep giving partial sun. So it's all just problem solving though. It's all problem solving. I could keep them in the sun if I put them in deeper pots or if I pruned them more, you know, things like that. So you just always got to think of how, what's the work around. So. so you mentioned one of them that you looked at the roots or you checked the roots or something. So on your olive, so you get this olive. When are you going to do? So you this, ever just, I mean, because we are in the middle of winter here. So do hmm. not look at the roots. Oh, no, you can look at the roots. So you okay. can peel back and look at, at the okay. Nabari and stuff. But also things like that olive, there's different trees where, where Nabari is important and it isn't. Okay, so okay. if you're doing a deadwood tree, like where half of it is collected and dead, the nabari is irrelevant. Right. So it doesn't even matter. Like if you have a sweet juniper, they, they'll tell you if you go and you take a sweet juniper to a guy and it has perfect nabari, he'll kill half your tree. Okay. And be like, you don't need that. Okay. So it's, uh, it's not something that's used in deadwood designs. It's more for uh, when you're trying to show uh, field grown trees or landscape trees, uh, things like that, trees that are supposed to invoke that powerful uh, first couple branches. So you need to. Anything feel grown, realistically. Okay. Um, Can I ask you a question that has nothing to do with today? Sure. This olive, mm -hmm. how old is it, and why doesn't it have the own So trunk? this is a very, very old olive. Uh, hard to say, but judging by the deadwood, it's probably 50 to 60 years old. Um, and so it's rotted out. And also, uh, from the guy who collected it in California, it was actually broken away from a previous olive. So it's like a sliver of another olive. Uh, one of the reasons why this tree was so important to me and why I wanted to get it <laughs> is that the deadwood on it is ancient deadwood. So there's some, uh, some character to bonsai to deadwood that can't be replicated. So you can't carve it into the tree. You can't uh, imitate it into the tree. The only way to get it on a tree is to have it be very, very old. And so for things like that, I'll take a sliver of you know, 60 year old deadwood <coughs> and any day of the week. So it was just a very unique tree. Very unique. And so what I'm probably gonna end up doing is building it, you know, off of an angle, something right. like that, right. so that we can kind of illustrate both the, the cavity in it, get the movement of it, right. uh, and pick up a little bit of that.